In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Liturgy of the Word for today, the Thursday of the seventh week of Easter. It's awesome to be with you all. Um, today's gospel, one of my favorites. I'm probably going to say that tomorrow, too, but uh, this one really is one of my favorites, so I'm excited to share a little reflection on it with you. But as we begin, let's call to mind our sin. Let's call to mind those areas in our lives, those actions, those whatever it is that are keeping us from being fully present here. And let's ask God for his loving mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. May your spirit, O Lord, we pray, imbue us powerfully with spiritual gifts, that he may give us a mind pleasing to you and graciously conform us to your will. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Wishing to determine the truth about why Paul was being accused by the Jews, the commander freed him and ordered the chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin to convene. Then he brought Paul down and made him stand before them. Paul was aware that some were Sadducees and some Pharisees, so he called up before the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I'm a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees, I am on trial for hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the group became divided. For the Sadducees said that there was no resurrection or angels or spirits, while the Pharisees acknowledged all three. A great uproar occurred, and some scribes belonging to the Pharisees' party stood up and sharply argued, We find nothing wrong with this man. Suppose a spirit or an angel has spoken to him. The dispute was so serious that the commander, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, ordered his troops to go down and rescue Paul from their midst and take him into the compound. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for just as you have been born witness to my cause in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness in Rome. The word of the Lord.
Lord, my allotted portion and my cup. You it is who hold fast my lot. I set the Lord ever before me. With him at my right hand I shall not be disturbed. glad and my soul rejoices my body too abides in confidence because you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld nor will you suffer your faithful one to undergo corruption to life, fullness of joys in your presence, the delights at your right hand A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Lifting up his eyes to heaven, Jesus prayed, saying, I pray not only for these, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, so that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And I have given them the glory you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be brought to perfection as one, that the world may know that you sent me and that you loved them even as you loved me. Father, they are your gift to me. I wish that where I am they also may be with me, that they may see my glory that you gave me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world also does not know you, but I know you, and they know that you sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will make it known, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Mm, see, I told you it was a good one. So, I have this morbid fascination with people's last words. There's just something about the last thing that someone speaks. It's kind of like their last chance to articulate, to put words to this soul length that we spend a lifetime trying to get out. 
Um, here are a couple of my favorites. Beethoven, um, he said, friends applaud, the comedy is finished. Uh, here's Leonardo da Vinci, this one hurts. I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. That's from Leonardo da Vinci, yikes. Um, here's one, how about a revolutionary, Che Guevara. I know you've come to kill me, shoot. You are only going to kill a man. How about Karl Marx? This one's kind of funny. Um, last words are for fools who haven't said enough. And then the, uh, the gold star, the uh, number one, the best, top, best ever last words goes to Oscar Wilde. This wallpaper and I are fighting a duel to the death. Either it goes or I do. Love it. So, of course, today we kind of get Jesus's last words. Um, the, the, this is his last statement. It's the farewell discourse in the Gospel of John. Immediately after this, it goes into the Passion narrative. So this is like the last teaching that Jesus gives in the Gospel of John. So whether these were his last words or this is the Gospel writer, either way, we are invited to kind of hear these words as a sort of climax to his teaching, as a sort of high point of what Jesus wants to say before he leaves this earth. And what is that high point? Well, it's this, that they may all be one. Could we possibly have more important words for us today? Our world is so ridiculously divided right now. And I mean, I'll admit, I'm young. Maybe it has always been this way. Maybe politics has always been toxic. Uh, or maybe we're just more aware of it right now. Maybe it just comes and goes and we happen to be in one of those times when it's coming. But um, I don't know. Sociologists, political science scientists, Experts from all walks of life seem to say that the world is more divided now than it ever has been. Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, rural, urban, black, white, pro-vaccine, anti-vaccine, Steelers, Eagles. Uh, actually, never mind. Forget that last one. That one is very legitimate, and there is a right answer to that one. <laughs> but no matter where you look, it's all division. It seems to be that the opposite of that they may all be one is the law of the land. But here's where I'm going to throw something out there today and um, suggest something a little crazy. I don't think these divisions are the problem. I don't think these differences of opinion and even the kind of animosity, I don't think that is the problem. I think these divisions, this disunity, I think it's a symptom of a much, much deeper problem. I believe the problem is that we, collectively as a society, are going through a massive identity crisis right now. I think that we have forgotten who we are. And that's led to us trying to find ourselves in these labels and groups and ideologies that promise us belonging, but always seem to fall short. Think about it for a second. Isn't there comfort in surrounding yourself with people who are just like you? Doesn't it feel safe to be in a bubble of people you can trust? Don't we all just want to belong? Of course. Of course we do. I think that's one of the deepest longings of our hearts, to belong. But what happens when that little bubble of belonging is fragile? What happens when we know that deep down the identity that we've sort of constructed to give us an artificial sense of belonging, what happens when we know that that identity is fragile, that it's based on political affiliations or geographical location or preferences for this or that or even religion? What happens when these superficial identities are threatened. What happens is that we have to push back. We have to dig our heels in with these false identifications because we know 
that they're only surface deep and any amount of threat to that identity will make it disappear like that. You see, when we don't know who we are, the only way we can define ourselves is through opposition. But Jesus offers us a new way. Jesus prays that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Friends, do you know that you are a child of God and that God dwells in you? Do you know that your true identity has nothing to do with where you live, who you voted for, what you prefer, what religion you are, any of these superficial identities? Do you realize that your truest name is simply love? I wonder what would happen if we could all embrace the wild vulnerability of letting ourselves be loved by God. Loved in a way that he actually lives within us through the Holy Spirit. I wonder what would happen to our divisions. I wonder what would happen if we suddenly realized who we are. I just have to bet that these divisions would almost immediately fizzle away. How beautiful this world would be if only we could know that our deepest identity is nothing more than child of God. And that, again, what unites us is infinitely greater than what divides us. That they may all be one. You know, I feel like there's a missed opportunity here. I feel like I should end these reflections with an invitation to a political fundraiser or something. I don't know. Let me know in the comments if I can count on your vote. I'm very much just kidding. Here are our questions for the day. What does unity mean to you? And what are your stumbling blocks to experiencing unity with others? Have an awesome rest of your day today, and I will see you all tomorrow.